What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Scenes, the making of the Fast and the Furious. I'm Craig Lieberman. You probably know me by now. Hopefully you do. You've done a little research on the movie. My name has probably popped up. I was the guy who was the technical advisor for the first two films and assisted with the third film for predominantly helping them out fighting with extra cars. I also recently published a book. It's called Crashing Cars on Amazon. I talk about it on my Instagram. But for this series on YouTube, I want to get into a little more detail. I want to talk specifically about certain aspects of the film, and we'll get into that as we go through the episodes over time. This week's episode, we're going to talk about street racing and why it's no longer a part of the Fast and Furious franchise. We all remember the first movie. The first movie was action-packed. It was full of illegal street racing. In fact, it pretty much started off with illegal street racing, and the whole plot more or less revolved around illegal street racing. The hijacking, uh, truck hijacking sequence subplot was just kind of a distraction. It just kind of tied everything together and gave you some drama in, the, in what was supposed to be a dramatic film. But still, throughout that movie, it was all about street racing. All right, so Too Fast, Too Furious. Fast forward to Too Fast, Too Furious. Well, what happened there? A little different scenario. It wasn't so much about street racing. We had an opening street race, and then we had that barrel race scenario. And this one was more about Carter Verone and his criminal enterprises, and it just lacked the street racing that we all wanted to see, or most of us wanted to see. And again, this was back around 2002, 2003, and the market was starting to change a little bit. Universal recognized that an action film would have to uh, take the franchise to its new future, and that's just the way it was going to be. And so this was the first attempt to go in that direction. It had a new director, it had John Singleton, who came from Boys in the Hood, and so the whole movie went down a different path. And then, of course, there was Fast and Furious Toko, Tokyo Drift. I think Universal listened to the people from, uh, who had watched the first couple of movies and said, hey, you're starting to get too far away from the original concept, which was street racing. And, of course, Tokyo Drift was mostly about street racing, but in Japan. Of course, Tokyo Drift's ridiculous story plot did not save it at the box, box office. It was uh, not a very good performer at the time. It was the worst of the three movies in the franchise at that time. And of course, the plot itself was just odd. You got a guy who's convicted of illegal street racing, so you, what do you do? You send him to the ca global capital of illegal street racing, Tokyo. That's sort of like putting a pedophile in charge of a Girl Scout troop, if you know what I'm saying, right? Since then, the movies have gone down a completely different path. They're action films with guns and explosions, each film having more grandiose special effects and explosions than the film it, it, uh, that they came before it. So here we are, eight films in the franchise, and we're seeing things like 14-mile races down runways and explosions and special forces, tactics and weapons and all kinds of stuff. So where did the franchise decide to go off on a different tangent? I'll tell you when. When they started looking at box office numbers. Universal had done a bunch of research, and they recognized that the Latino audience was huge. And as you saw, there was more and more elements from the Latino market, more and more uh, attempts to address that market in every subsequent movie as we went along. And that's good. Diversity is definitely a good thing. The cast grew in diversity, the cast grew in size. Also, good things appeals to a wider audience. And they started to see their box office numbers go up. So, why don't they go back to illegal street racing? Why won't they do that for us? I'll tell you why. It's about the money. Universal is a company. They have a responsibility to shareholders. They want to make money because their shareholders make money. If you look at the data of the, the box office results, just the box office results of the eight movies, you can see that the movies that focused around street racing did much worse than the movies that did not focus on street racing. As of late 2017, here are the worldwide box office numbers. These numbers are basically the amount of tickets and money that Universal has sold for the movies. In last place, Tokyo Drift with $157 million. In seventh place, the original movie, The Fast and the Furious, at $206 million. In sixth place was Too Fast, Too Furious, which made $237 million. In fifth place was Fast and Furious, which was the fourth installment of the film, at $363 million. Fast Five made $629 million. It ranked in fourth place. Fast and Furious Six made $789 million, taking third place slot. Second place slot was The Fate of the Furious, which made $1.2 billion, and Furious Seven made $1.5 billion. And again, that's as of late 2017. These numbers will continue to grow. So there you have it. It absolutely proves that street racing is not a critical component to the success of these movies. No one wants to watch 15-second Honda Civics go down a drag strip, whether it's in an industrial park or a professional drag race. 
Yeah. I know. I ran a race series for five years, and I can tell you that when the street cars came up there, there was nobody sitting in the stands. When the pro cars came up there, everybody was sitting in the stands. And the same thing goes globally. You got to also remember that if you want to digest this content, if you want to look at illegal street racing, you can do it for free. There are plenty of videos and there are plenty of television programs. Street Outlaws is a perfect example. Street Outlaws has been on TV for what, 10 years? You know what their average viewership is? If you take a look at the Nielsen ratings, Nielsen ratings are the ratings that evaluate all TV shows for the size of the audience. They're doing about 880,000 views per episode. That means 880,000 people or 880,000 households are watching their show on any given episode. You compare that with like the Oscars, if somebody's watching the Oscars, it's 20 million viewers or whatever the number is, right? Completely different. So in a global audience of seven or eight billion people, right? That means 880,000 houses, TV sets, were tuned in to street outlaws out of eight billion people. Clearly the audience isn't big enough. Universal knows this. So Universal's trying to produce a movie that's gonna appeal to a wider audience. Street racing isn't it. If you want to watch more street racing videos, you can go to 1320videos.com. They have tons of street racing videos. You know what their average viewership is? It's about 300,000 viewers. So there you have it. 300,000 people are watching street racing videos. And don't get me wrong, 1320 videos does a great job of street racing videos. I watch them all the time. But how do you build a story around that? Another example of how street racing TV shows have not done well, MTV back in the day produced a show called The Life of a Street Racer. I had high hopes for this show, and I think a lot of people did. That show was produced right during the meat of the craze. It was around 2003, 4, 5, as I recall. It's been some time. But it focused on the life of actual street racers, and it followed them into their garage, into their home, into their personal life, into their workspace and really follow them through the process of what compelled them to do it, why they did it, where they did it, how they did it, and what they used to do it. So it was an interesting show, but it just didn't get viewers. And this was on a prime network. MTV it was arguably the best network for reaching that all-important male audience, say from 14 to 34 years old, in that, right in the meat of that audience. And the show failed. Why did it fail? There's not enough people interested in street racing. I know we think we all are, and that we think we are a much bigger than we are audience that we really are, but that's just not the case. So going forward, Universal will continue to produce these crazy blockbusters with wild action scenes, stunts and explosions, and who knows what. It would be nice if they brought back some component of street racing in the film, perhaps in part in the final installment of the franchise, which is slated to be part 10. Perhaps maybe Paul's son can come back and then he gets involved in illegal street racing, maybe at the very, very end of the movie. Who knows? We'll see. But that's it, folks. That's why illegal street racing is not a big part of the franchise and why I do not expect it to be a big part of the franchise going future. Thanks for tuning in. Catch me in the next episode.